Welcome everyone to yet another edition of Why Should We Care About the Indo-Pacific. Jim Caruso, I am in my wife's hometown of Davao City in the Philippines. And since we last talked, we did our first, or I did our first uh, live one-on-one -on -one interview with Senator Risa Hontiveros here in the Philippines. I watched it. She was uh, quite a forceful woman. Yeah, it was, it was a really interesting interview. We talked about um, China's uh, criminal gaming syndicates, which it, here in the Philippines, it's actually a really big deal right now. Uh, and believe it or not, like three days after we recorded the, the interview, the president came out and, and banned them. Um, so it was a really well-timed interview. And so if you're curious why, you know, in his State of the Nation address, President Ferdinand Marcos Jr., came out and as the highlight of his his address banned pogos something called pogos go back and listen to that interview it was a really great interview really fascinating uh and if you didn't know anything about china's criminal gaming gaming uh gaming syndicates uh really something to to to, to behold it's a sordid tale i'll look for the movie <laughs> all right jim who do we have with us today well we are very fortunate to have uh professor arisho dharmasan he is a professor of international law at the University of Indonesia. He's also the, the director of the Center for Sustainable Ocean Policy. Um, he lectures on international law of the sea, a specialist on foreign policy and the law of the sea and Asia Pacific, especially regarding the, the South China Sea, which of course is a key focus of ours. So Pak Aristio, welcome. So glad to have you with us. And uh, we're gonna ask you our first question for our American audiences. Why should we care about international law in the South China Sea? It doesn't seem to be working. How, how can international law be used? Right. Of course, thank you very much. Uh, it is really a pleasure to, to join the podcast after sometimes being a, 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 a watcher of the, of the podcast. So it's really delighted. Thank you very much. So I think uh, if the question was whether or not uh, why the international law and Indo-Pacific matters, in particular for Indonesian audience or in, in Asia, I think it because of several things. First, of course, I think if you're observing the dynamics of the world's politics now, I think international laws play a very crucial role, if not essentials. If you observe, for example, in any... Uh, speeches made by the foreign ministers, the diplomats, analysts, they always in, emphasize the importance of international law in, in any kind of circumstances. What happens in the South China Sea, for example, UNCLOS is very much the keywords of all of analysis, right? They, they, they always say that it's important to stick to the rules-based international orders, to international law and the United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea. So it's, it's, it's really things that I think uh, one of the important inventions of the global communities of international throughout the history is, of course, in keeping our worlds more secure, in keeping our world more uh, equal for, for any countries. And of course, observing being here in, in Asia and in Indonesia, I think international has always been a tool for, for a third world countries, for a, for a new developing country to have an equal footings and getting a benefits from the international system as well. And with the questions of why Indo-Pacific matters for Indonesia, uh, uh, to be more uh, specific, is that Indo-Pacific will allow Indonesia to have a more influence in the international communities. If we example, uh, for example, when uh, in the first terms uh, of President Joko Widodo, it was the, it was the initial terms when the terms Indo-Pacific was introduced, and President Joko Widodo back then introduced the terms of a global maritime fulcrum for Indonesia to become the center of access of the uh, uh, international politics. And that's very much aligned with the uh, concept of Indo-Pacific, which is trying to connect the Indian Oceans and the Pacific Oceans. And geographically, Indonesia lies in the middle of these two huge oceans and very important geopolitically to become an axis. I think that is a, is a way on how Indonesia uh, it should care more about the Indo-Pacific politically. Uh, and, and strategically. And I think Indonesia has been uh, considering the Pacific as very important. One of the evidence, uh, I should say, is that Indonesia has been successfully promoting what we call as the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific. Of course, we recognize the concept of the uh, Indo-Pacific. We endorse, I should say, by introducing the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific and trying to put Indonesia and ASEAN more relevant in the, in the broader discourse of the Indo-Pacific. So I think Indonesia has politically recognized the importance of the Indo-Pacific through the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific, through ASEAN centralities. And I should say that the AOIP, which is endorsed by Indonesia, was, was very much successful. It was, it was recognized by a lot of Indo-Pacific strategies, by the United States, for example. It's recognized the centralities of the AOIP. 
the Indo-Pacific documents released by the European Union, for example, to recognize the centralities of AOIP and also Canada and also uh, in some other countries. So I think Indonesia has recognized Indo-Pacific as a very important area for, for Indonesia's strategic geopolitical outlook. And I think it is very important. And one of the back to the first questions is that we should uh, recognize international law as the the foundationals of of cooperations and engagement politics in the Indo Pacific. So, Aricio, thank you. Um, so, you introduced you know some new terms there, the ASEAN outlook on the Indo Pacific. I want to get back to that, but first, I want to kind of walk through international law as it as it applies to the maritime space, as it applies to the Indo-Pacific, and of course, especially as it applies to this very contentious area of the South China Sea. So let's rewind back to the 1980s when something called the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea was first sort of finalized, right? It, it was, you know, the 1983, we call it the 1983 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And then there was this whole series of ratifications and things that happened sort of country by country as it came into effect. and out of that whole drama, eventually, of course, you had China, which signed the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, and the United States, which sort of perversely very much abides by and asserts the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, but has never signed it. Yeah. So let's take us back to how did this how did this convention come together and what made it so significant? Mm -hmm. Right. That is a very important question. So I think if we talk about the significance and the histories of the law of the sea, we can only start in the 1980s when the convention is being signed in Montego Bay, Jamaica. Right? We have to go back further in the 1940s and 50s where there is a new independent state post-colonialism who is demand more justice regime, regimes for the oceans. I mean, like the oceans provide a lot of sources for economy, commerce. And, that, and, and at the times, the, the third world countries, which, which basically one of the ideas was coming from Indonesia through the Bandung Conference to create a more equitable and justice international uh, relations and international law through the Bandung Conference, conference and the uh, NIO, the New Economic Emerging uh, Order, which, which then uh, uh, initiate the, the, the creation of a new legal regime of the ocean. So historically, the oceans or UNCLOS has, has been part of like the initiative for from a global communities, uh, particularly also the developing countries, which need a, a more a justice regimes of international law, and that was it was, was eventually started uh, the negotiations and, and concluded in 1983s, as, as you mentioned. And why is this important? I always remember uh, one of my professors, uh, James Kraska, told me that uh, uh, arguably UNCLOS is the second most important treaties ever made in the human history, and that is after, of course, the UN, UN, UN Charter. That is because of its covers a huge part of the earth and it covers a lot of issues from securities, from environment and uh, a lot of uh, issues uh, in the ocean. So and, and the, the stake that is crucial, it is very important for all countries and all countries with the uh, uh, introducement of UNCLOS have their interests actually uh, in, in UNCLOS. Uh, the U.S. get their uh, interest in navigations. All new developing countries have the interest of the exclusive economic zones to be able to utilize the uh, marine resource. So it's a convention that is, is very important and it's all, already represent the interest of nearly all countries, including China at the time, right? So the interest of all countries to comply with UNCLOS, I think it's, it's very much the interest of everybody and, and therefore with the interest of, of arguably uh, China as well. So upholding the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea as the epitome of the rules-based international order, I think it's very important for most countries uh, uh, to assure. So I agree with you, Pak Aristo. And I also think that, especially for countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, which are archipelagic, they are basically island nations, mm -hmm. having a law of the sea is especially important. And mm -hmm. yet what we're seeing is um, an arbitral tribunal finding using international law fines for one of your fellow ASEAN members, Philippines, against China, there doesn't seem to be countries saying, okay, here's the law, which is very important to us, and standing by the Philippines. Is this a matter of law or political will or something else? 
Yeah, I think uh, if you talk about the the country support behind the tribunals, I think it's involved uh, a number of things. The first one, of course, I think in the interest of all countries in the world, particularly in Southeast Asia, to support the, the tribunals, right? I mean, uh, more of the uh, uh, Southeast Asia climate states against China, I, I should say, have a lot of benefits and, and winning against China is based on their tribunal decisions. But I think if, if, if we talk about how to respond and endorse the tribunal decisions, I think there's a lot of, of, of considerations, of course, uh, of, of Southeast Asian countries. And one of the major reasons, I should say, is their relationships with, with Beijing, uh, which have a quite increase in, in, in a number of, in, in the past few years. So I think uh, uh, Southeast Asia countries, including Indonesia, I should say, uh, they want to try to balance their interests in the South China Seas, their interests with the respect of the rule of international law on one hand, but they also want to try, they don't want to upset Beijing and they want to try to maintain a good economic relations with Beijing. So I think I, I should say that that's how or what's behind Indonesia uh, uh, positions towards the tribunal decisions. If you remember back in 2016, when the tribunal was first introduced, Indonesia wasn't explicitly endorsed the tribunal decisions, even though it is quite clearly the tribunals has benefit Indonesia's interests. I think if you remember at the time, the political ease, I think Jokowi at the time was a very pragmatic uh, president who want to build a good economic relationship with Beijing. But at the time, Indonesia was, I think that's going to be a bit of, might explain why we're not explicitly supporting the tribunal decisions. But move on to the 2020s, where we have a more escalations with, with China. Uh, in the South China Sea, we feel more threatened. Then we then support or we endorse formally the, the tribunal's decision. So I think that is the the thing uh, uh, which which might explain Indonesia's positions, also Southeast Asian countries, and trying to balance, I think, the interest of 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 security and sovereignty interest in the South China Seas with their relationship with Beijing. And I think it's not only a unique case for Indonesia. I think it's the same case with Vietnam, it's the same case with Malaysia, even the Philippines, right? Uh, so, so I think that is that might explain uh, the endorsements towards the tribunal's decisions. So I, I want to keep moving back in time a little bit because I want to try to understand how we got to where we are on the in you know as we try to bring together these two different regimes when it comes to international law. On one hand, we have the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea and its its progeny, if you will, the the arbitral tribunal case in 2016, in which a a a, a, a tribunal in the Hague ruled on. UNCLOS as it applies to the South China Sea and the Philippines assertions, right? And then you have this separate process in which ASEAN comes together with China to try to work out a, an, an arrangement. And that started in 2002 with something called the Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea or the DOC. So as of 1996, China signs UNCLOS. But by 2002, the ASEAN and China are getting together on this declaration. Why, since China had signed on to UNCLOS, and presumably that would govern the, the waters of the, uh, of the South China Sea as, as, as well as other waters, why was there a need to try to get together on a declaration of conduct specifically between ASEAN and China? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is a very good, uh, important question. So of course, uh, China and, and, and ASEAN claimants as a, as a party to the United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea, of, of UNCLOS, right? Uh, despite all these violations uh, uh, of international laws in the South China Seas, I think it is important to stick to the regulations. And if we're talking about the Code of Conduct or the DOC, I, I think it's, it's we, should, we, we could argue that it is a part of the implementations of UNCLOS as well. One of the provisions of UNCLOS says that if, it's a, if, a, if, a, if, a, if a state parties have a pending delimitation agreement or... Uh, a dispute over a certain maritime area, there's a certain obligations. And one of the obligations was first, not hampers the negotiations, not make an action, action, uh, actions that can provoke the peace and security in the disputed area. But there's also an obligation to try to create a regulations uh, prior, what we call it as a, as, a, as, a, as a preliminary agreement prior to the limitation itself. And we could, we could also argue and see that the code of conduct is part of the preliminary agreement in which countries might agree upon what are the measures that can be done or should not be done in the uh, disputed maritime area. Or later on, there are some countries, for example, also negotiate a, a, a joint development agreements and, and so on and so forth. So that is a part, I should say, 
the negotiation of the code of conduct, we can we can argue that as a doc document that implement some of the obligations under the law of the sea conventions, uh, particularly concerning to the uh, uh, disputed maritime area. So I think uh, that is that is, is of course uh, a, one of the a way that we can looking at the negotiation or the importance of the COC. But of course, I think it's going forward. There's a lot of challenge. There's a lot of issues within the COC itself, and and which might. Uh, uh, create the uh, very much difficulties in terms of the the conclusions of the the code of conduct. So I'm sorry, no, Jim, so, just just because yeah. uh, I want to I want to follow up because I really want to try to put this in context. So 1996, China signs own clause. Mm -hmm. 2002, there's a separate process in which ASEAN and China get together on a declaration on the conduct yep. of, of the parties, but then that flows into these other negotiations also between ASEAN and China on a code of conduct. Mm -hmm. Why after the declaration on the conduct of the parties of the South China Sea in 2002, mm -hmm. was there still a need to go forward with a code of conduct? Mm -hmm. And you know, what, what was, did they know when they signed the DOC that they would still need to do a COC or did they think the DOC would be enough? Mm -hmm. I think the reason behind the initiative of the negotiation of the code of conduct is that is to have a more specific regulations, which more comprehensive in order to limit the activities in the disputed area. Of course, the COC will not resolve the overlapping claim. It's not a treaty that's going to be uh, ending up with the limitations. But the COC, the, the, the aim of the COC was to create more on a, a, a regulations, which then limits and, and de to be able to de-escalate, for example, what kind of law enforcement that we can, uh, uh, that as the claimant states could enforce uh, in the South China Sea, whether or not there's a, a what kind of a cooperation, specific cooperation. So it, I, I, the, the idea was behind the negotiation of COC, I should say, is to have a more comprehensive and detailed uh, regulations on how the, the law enforcement can be done so it can avoid the more escalation and tensions. And a bit of similar, uh, of a, it's not an exact thing, but Indonesia and Malaysia, for example, you have a MOU, uh, in order to, to limit law enforcement in the and the, the limited maritime area. And it aims to provide, for example, to, to de-escalate so that uh, no claimant countries can have an excessive uh, or assertive uh, law enforcement mechanisms and so on and so forth. It could be diverse. Uh, pe uh, parties can agree upon uh, the regulations of resources there as well. So, so, so But I think the, the idea that's behind it is to have a more comprehensive and more detailed mechanisms to avoid uh, any escalations or uh, more assertive uh, 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 actions and behaviors of, of a certain party. So I think that is the, the ideas uh, uh, if, uh, with the negotiation of uh, COC after the DOC, I should say. Well, we've, we've, this has been under negotiation now for over 20 years. Yep. We're always told that next year it's going to get done. Yep. Um, I have to say I'm losing confidence. Uh, and does, does, do you think it's going to happen? And if so, what will change as a result of it? Yeah, at first I was very optimist that uh, the Code of Conduct, at first, uh, that we'd be confident because there, if we see the statement, there's a lot of statements from the Chinese officials, Southeast Asian officials that we need and we want the COC to be concluded. But after I talk more to colleagues from the Legal Advisors Office and the uh, uh, Kemlu's, uh, I'm getting more pessimist that there's going to be have, ever to happen. Because if we see the statement, it is for, it's generally a vague statement from the foreign ministers or the, the director general for ASEAN. But when it comes to the lawyers who are involved in the discussions, I think that is a very difficult uh, for, for the, for the uh, uh, substance of the negotiations. I think there's a lot of differences. There's a lot of points that should be negotiated. But from the perspective of Indonesia, for example, the, the limitation was, the crucial limitation was in the geographical scope of the code of conduct. I mean, uh, there's uh, uh, issues on whether or not the code of conduct should be binding or non-binding, or whether or not there should be a compliance mechanisms and so on and so forth. But in, from the Indonesian perspective, what I heard and I talked to a colleague uh, who, who involved the negotiations is that uh, the geographical scope is very much an issue. Uh, for example, uh, for, uh, uh, China wants that the COC should be uh, include the nine inch line because if it's not in the nine inch line, it's, it's very much less in the Chinese interest, right? But on the other hand, Indonesia is, is in a very limit. Indonesia will not agree upon anything which includes the nine inch line for a couple of reasons. First, the tribunals has decided that it's illegal under international law. And to be agreed upon something which is illegal under international law, 
is very much uh, it's, it's very much dangerous for the international communities, right? Because it, it, it shows that we are not respecting the rules of international law just based on, a, on, on the vague claims of a certain historic claims of, of a certain parties. So that is very dangerous for all these Southeast Asian countries. But secondly, which is more important for Indonesia, was that if we recognize that the COC will include the, 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 the nine dash line, it means that we are recognized that we have an overlapping claim with China in the North Natuna Sea. Because of course, we, it is clear that we don't have any overlapping island claim with China. China is not claiming the North Natuna Sea. But if we consider and if we see the nine dash line, it overlaps with Indonesia's exclusive economic zone. So once we recognize the geographical scope of the code of conduct includes the nine dash line, which means that we we recognize the Chinese claims and we recognize that we have an overlapping claim. And that has become the the very limitations of Indonesia. And that's why I think if, uh, last year Indonesia was the chair of ASEAN and, and South China Sea wasn't much discussed. And it, Indonesia even put the conclusion of the code of conduct as part of like their benchmark that they're, they're trying to reach, right? Because of course, based on that, that, that lot of discussions, uh, uh, government officials, lawyers in, in, in the negotiations recognize that it's very difficult for the COC to be recognized. Even though, for example, they, they're trying to make a COC with a very vague regulations on the scope, I think it's, 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 it's just very, uh, Indonesia will not uh, agree to uh, any certain of like those kind of vagueness and ambiguity because it might turn back against Indonesia's interests. So it would be better of having no code of conduct at all rather than and agreeing upon something that is gonna be backlash to Indonesia's interest. So if we are truly in a place where and I, I, this, I, this feels like this is the developing consensus that actually there will never be a code of conduct for the yeah. South China Sea. And, but what we keep hearing is, well, but it's good to have the negotiations because it gives a place for dialogue, right? But how do, how do you weigh that against this? So what, what, what China continues to do is refer things over to the code of conduct negotiations. And couldn't you say that China is simply using that as a delaying tactic in order to, to consolidate its gains, its gains through maritime force so that by the time you get to the point where you either abandon or compromise on the code of conduct, China is already in an extremely strong position. So at this point, are the code of conduct negotiations actually just doing more harm than good? Well, I think I would also agree, of course, there's a lot of conversations going on uh, that uh, it's better to keep the negotiations going rather than we don't have any channel of communication at all. And I think I, I'm afraid I have to agree with that uh, because, of course, if, we, if there's no uh, communications, there's no channel of communication and conversations diplomatically going on, I think it create more risk for any escalations to be happened. Uh, and, and there's also less of a new where uh, uh, ASEAN state and China can, can negotiate upon something. But so, so I think I, I'm afraid I have to agree that because that's the only options that we have. On the second point on whether or not China's gonna be getting stronger and, and, in, and, and that, that is a tactics that China use, I think uh, that might also be possible. But I think what most important for Southeast Asia is that, OK, it's living the code of conduct. I think it's, it's, it's not going to be the policies of any Southeast Asian countries because of the whole reasons that we already discussed. But I think we also have to make a, a to think about any alternative. What if, if the code of conduct is not successfully uh, concluded? I, I mean, like, uh, to be frankly speaking, I think I agree with you that we will never have any code of conduct at all in the future. Right. So I think I would agree. So. It's times, I think, for, for ASEANs, not, on, not abandon negotiation of a code of conduct, but to seriously think about what are the other scenarios that we might have if the code of conduct is failed, whether or not, I mean, like bring a case before the international tribunals might not be, I mean, like considering what happened in 2016, might not be in a very effective way, but what, what, what else? So I think that is, that is a, a very important. But I mean, like if we're reflecting on all this conflict, it is very difficult to imagine that this conflict is going to be resolved uh, in our generations. Uh, or I, I, I really like what, what my colleague from, from the foreign ministry say that it is likely less likely that we ever see the South China Sea dispute ever resolved in our lifetime. I mean, like he said that he, he might want to bet his career for that, right? Because a bilateral relation, um, maritime delimitations 
between two countries, for example, it might take you 30 years, Indonesia and Malaysia, for example. So we're a, a good neighboring countries. We don't have any major political issues and we resolve our maritime delimitations for 30 years for like we're very simple lines between two countries. And you can imagine the South China Sea is involving a, a, a more than five countries. It's involving a very huge stakes of uh, geopolitical tensions. Uh, it's, it's, there have been a security interest, there have been economic interest that is involved in the rivalries of the US and China. How can we imagine that those kind of very complex disputes to be resolved uh, uh, in our generations? So what we, the only options that we have, I'm afraid, is that to make sure that the dispute will not get escalate to an open war, right? That is the thing that uh, a lot of analysts and, and officials, I think it should afraid of, right? So, so the, the thing is very tricky here so, and abandoning the code of conduct negotiations or abandoning conversations with China, I don't think it's an option for all Southeast Asian countries, right? Given the stake and, and the thing that uh, they, the, the interest that they have and, and the strategies that they have. So uh, it is very uh, uh, tricky. And another thing, uh, the options uh, uh, from the two-track two and scholars was that what, uh, what if ASEAN states make uh, some sort of like a code of conduct only among Southeast Asian claimants ain't uh, leaving uh, China uh, outside the table. And that it sounds like possible from the track to uh, uh, scholars, analysts perspective. But when we talk to the officials, if, when I talk to the officials in the foreign ministries in Jakarta, for example, they say like, it, it sounds possible, but is it politically is impossible for the diplomats and the foreign ministers to, to take that path because they try wanna, they don't, they really don't wanna to having a very, Hence, uh, relationship with with Beijing. So I think that is uh, options in the table should be open, and I think exploring uh, uh, ideas. I think it matters. But when it comes to the uh, to the practical choice of policymakers within the foreign ministries, uh, I think they they very much considering the view and the position of China. Uh, I'm afraid I have to say that. So what it sounds like is um, relations maintaining good, especially economic relations with China is in fact more important than having control over the assets in the South China Sea that are under dispute. China being aware of that does what we call the salami slicing, adding a little yep. bit here and there, very slowly having basically de facto control through the islands they've created and yep. the militarization of those islands. Yep. Um, I guess the question is at what point does that balance between economic interests and political and security interests, how does that change? Are people thinking about that? I mean, I mean, I think that that is very true. And I think that is a very sad uh, uh, fact that is happening. Uh, for example, uh, Luhut Panjaitan, as you might be aware of, is a very strong uh, cabinet member of President Joko Widodo. And if you see him after every escalation that happens in Natuna, he will always make a statement. And his statement was quite a soft to China. Like, I mean, like, it's not... The, 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 the escalation that we have in the North Atuna Sea, it's not our sovereignty, it's our sovereign rights over the resource and so on and so forth. So his tone is very much soft towards Beijing. And I, I, what, I, what I understand is that because he want to secure the Chinese investment in Indonesia. So that perspective, I should say, that is the, uh, the, per, the, the, the perspective that these, the Joko administrations have and policies, right? But what kind of the limits? Uh, I'm not very sure, but uh, I, I suppose that the leaderships of president might have huge significance uh, towards policy in the South China Seas. I think if you remember the Philippines, for example, the uh, Ninoy administrations and Duterte, they have a very, very strong shift. I think so leadership, I think it, it matters, uh, right? And the second one uh, is that I think in to what extent the, the assertiveness or the sense of threat that China's gave, uh, I think it also matters. Uh, uh, I, I, I talked earlier about Indonesia's then finally endorsed the, tri the tribunal's uh, decision. This is because of the incident. We have a lot of incidents that we have with China in 2019. So the sense of security or threat perceptions uh, towards China, I think it it's might uh, uh, push a different kind of policy response as well. Uh, but I think the, the, the quite interesting thing that also might influence is that what happened with the with, with China and the Philippines. I mean, like in the Shangri-La dialogue, I think we discussed it earlier at the CSS conference, it made matters. I mean, I mean like uh, Marcos mentions that if there is a unintended or intended killings of a Philippine personnel, it, may, it means the declaration of war. And I think what happens that might also change other Southeast Asia countries' uh, policies and perspective, right? What if uh, 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 accidentally, uh, considering what happened closely, 
with the uh, China uh, Coast Guard and the Philippine Coast Guard, uh, it's made a lot of possibilities, right? So what 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 if that uh, accident uh, happened, and what how other Southeast Asia countries should respond or will respond to that? I think it's it matters very much in this in this discourse. So you brought us Aristio to maybe sort of the core of the current question or the current controversy over ASEAN's um, role in South China Sea security or security writ large, which is that this gulf between nations' self-interest, economic self-interest, geopolitical self-interest vis-a-vis China, in some ways runs up straight up against the actual security problems being faced by Southeast Asian nations, and in this case, specifically the Philippines, where I am now. The, so I can tell you that from the perspective of a lot of people in Manila, where I spend a lot of my time, <clears throat> the question is being openly asked, what use is ASEAN in the Philippines' actual security situation, right? Because, I mean, recently we've seen a, a Jakarta Post editorial and uh, some statements by Prime Minister uh, Anwar Ibrahim from Malaysia about, well, you know, sort of tut-tutting the Philippines for co- coming up with its own security arrangements with Japan, with other outside nations, and not, not giving due deference to uh, ASEAN centrality. And you can almost, you know, the, the, the eye rolling in, 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 uh, in Manila is palpable, Right. Okay, here are these here are these people off in other places, you know, w- without our, you know, looking at the fact that this this large country is bullying this ASEAN country, the smaller ASEAN country, looking at the fact that they ignore international law as as you know, the, well, well, the international law they have signed up to. And and now all that they can offer us in our time of greatest need is finger wagging about going to other other powers when they themselves have been you know sort of toothless in in this particular our our most sort of existential threat. So why are they wrong? Well, I think that well I think if we, if we talk about the ASEAN, of course, there's a lot of huge limitations, and I think we uh, we are all aware of the, the limitation of ASEAN. And even the, the the security issues being discussed in ASEAN has always been a limitation. But but more importantly, I think limitations come from the members of ASEAN states, right? Let alone some countries like Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, Philippines, who are trying to balance the uh, the influence of of the U.S. and China. But some of the ASEAN countries, of course, like Laos, Cambodia, is very much clear that they are, uh, have a very strong stake with, with, with Beijing, right? So I think uh, putting a lot, of, I think we have to aware of that uh, of facts before expecting ASEAN to have a very strong positions uh, towards China or helping any other member, right? If we talk about South China Seas in ASEAN, I think it matters only for the climate states or what we call like the maritime ASEAN, yeah. right? Uh, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia is, is really an issue. But we talk with, with, with ASEAN colleague in, in non-maritime ASEAN, and I think that the conversation might be different, right? They will, they, they're not seeing the South China Sea as, a, as their security threat. Uh, so it, it gives a very different perspective. And that's why how we, how we expect ASEAN to, to react uh, based on that. And I think it's, there's a lot of limitations when we cannot really expecting the whole shot all the whole leaf forward of ASEANs in, in responding China. So I think that is a major interest, which which we can't really do much about it, right? That is a the certain fact. Uh, well, we should say like the nations behave based on their national interests and we, if we not serve their national interests, they will not uh, fully support any engagement or initiative in that matters of area, right? So so I think that is, we have to be very aware of, uh, of that as well. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I'm afraid that is the, the, the biggest limitations on how we can expect from ASEAN to, to do something uh, unified uh, in, in the issues of the South China Sea. Now, when we started the conversation, you mentioned how important UNCLOS was, especially to smaller nations, because it puts them on equal footing with the larger nations. But what we've seen over the past few years is China and the United States, for that matter, and other big countries basically are choosing when they care to apply and adhere to international law. Um, so I guess my question is, and this is increasing in frequency, it seems to me. So if we have international law being eroded and we have ASEAN being eroded, what's going to govern 
relations between countries in this volatile area? Yeah, I think that is a very important question, but I don't think that uh, any country, Southeast Asian countries, Asian countries will give up on the law of the sea conventions. I mean, it's not a perfect convention. There's a lot of development, which is not yet covered by UNCLOS, but I think it's the best thing that we can get and we can expect until now. Uh, opening, even opening UNCLOS for like real negotiations to, to consider including issues such as environment or technologies, I should say it's not going to be the options for for uh, for uh, countries or, or the parties of UNCLOS, right? So I think that is the, the, the very sad fact of international law. It's very much uh, uh, also depends on the countries that are practicing it. And uh, the, the thing that you say that that country is trying to pick and choose is not surprising at all. I mean, like the U.S. done that as well in, in many of the conventions. So. So, but I think the spirit that should be uh, gathered here in Southeast Asia and the broader international community is, of course, uh, more countries should, should support the rules-based international order. Countries should support uh, mechanisms uh, uh, offered by the law of the sea conventions. Uh, I mean, like uh, during the conference, uh, Bic mentioned about the importance of of uh, UNCLOS parties to rely upon UNCLOS mechanisms, right? They have a, a different dispute settlement mechanism. So relying more on that uh, legal framework within the United, the uh, UNCLOS, I think it, it's very important. But uh, but well, it's exposed the limits of international law. It's exposed the reality of international law that it's not an ideal, right? It's not it's international law like anything else. It's never an ideal situation. So I think that the uh, political support towards the law of the sea conventions, towards a rules based international order, I think it's the the best thing that we can we can do and we can expect. Well, I want to sort of wrap up our discussion today and i like to wrap wrap it up with something a little lighter you have you are currently in jakarta but you have been spending a lot of time recently working on uh, your your uh, uh your education in canberra in australia which is a very different kind of capital city how would you compare canberra to jakarta well, it's a it's a very huge uh, difference, right? I mean, uh, I, I, as I told you, when I first arrived in Canberra for the first time, I was I was shocked. It's not something that you can expect for like a capital city, right? I mean, comparing with Jakarta, Jakarta is a super crowded city, a lot of traffic jam, but uh, that is the capital city that we can, we would imagine, right? But but when I get to uh, Australia, I think uh, Canberra, they don't have any international flights. That was the first shock in my mind. They have a very uh, a quiet cities is no traffic jam at all. The pollution, the air uh, condition, it's it's just very good. So so it was really nice, and and the people there is really nice as well. I mean, like uh, people in a small country, small cities uh, compared to Jakarta. I think it's is a it is a very well. I, I well surprisingly, I re- enjoy it much than I expected. Uh, so it was a it was a really nice place, and a different people as well. I, I learned a lot from how Australia think. Uh, about the world as well, about the AUKUS and everything. It's just very different, right? So so I should say Indonesia and Australia, it's a very unique neighbor. We are a very, very different country. We have a very different histories. We have a different geography, uh, island and archipelagic. But the fact that we are neighbors, uh, there's uh, created a lot of uh, opportunities and, and push to, to work along together in resolving a lot of issues. We could ask you about Boston too, another Jim. small city compared to uh, to Jakarta. So you spent some time. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah, Washington, you say? No, Boston. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, it's just, yes. but but DC was still a very much a capital city, right? I mean, like the, the building, <laughs> the transport, the crowd. It's just, uh, it makes more sense to become a capital city. I think I should say it's a bridge. It's not too quiet. It's not too crowded, right? So, so I should say it's more more ideal as a capital. Well, Aristio, we do thank you for for coming on with us. Uh, we've been wanting to talk a little bit more about the law of the sea for a while, and and obviously it's a huge topic, a hugely important one, especially in that part of the world uh, where you are right this actually where both of us are right this minute. Um, and uh, it's, it's really been a pleasure having you on. I hope we we, we can talk again soon. Thank you very much. All right, Jim. Well, that was a really interesting discussion, and, and it really began with the with the question of UNCLOS, the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, which I think, I mean, honestly, I think that 
even today, even with all of the holes in it, or at least the holes in being able to kind of universally apply it, has to go down as, as Aristio sort of mentioned, one of the more, one of the most successful international agreements ever. I mean, it, just the, the, the extent to which it was almost universally adopted, even by the United States, which has never ratified it. Indeed. Uh, and it's, it's done a great job of helping settle disputes over the years, even without a policeman, because we have a court, but we have no one to enforce the law. And that, that, that's what's happening in the South China Sea. But as we know, the more often the law is violated, the fewer people say, why should it apply to me? And that's my concern. Yeah, I think that's that's a good concern. I mean, essentially, what happens if UNCLOS essentially crumbles in the South China Sea? Does that does that effect then just sort of get magnified in uh, in a lot of other places? It's sort of in, in some ways that way. It's it's like nuclear nonproliferation. It's it's useful for as long as it can kind of hold at least some line somewhere. But if it begins to sort of fall apart, you know, how quickly does the unraveling just sort of go global? That's right. And, and in a environment where there's more and more nationalism, and of course, when you sign a treaty, basically it's giving up some sovereign rights of your country to an international agreement. You can't do exactly what you want as a country. And, you know, the United States over the past few years has more and more said, uh, we're big and strong. We don't want to agree to everything we've already signed on to. And we saw President Trump rip up some agreements or not abide by them. So it's it's a real question. And if we are not doing it, which as the protectors of international law, historically, who's going to do it? Yeah. And, and I, you know, so to me, you know, when I look at UNCLOS, even as compared to other international bodies, right? I mean, for sure, there are trouble. There are problems with a lot of the international bodies that we put together, right? I mean, they get, they you know, we get you know, get other countries start dominating them that have that have very different interests, or you know, for example, you know, you know, trying to uh, apply criminal law when you have all of these different um, you know national laws as they apply to criminal conduct, very very hard. But when it comes to the law of the sea, this actually is a place where theoretically we all ought to be able to come to some sort of common understanding just because, you know, it, it's, it's, it's actually not as intrusive as a lot of the other kinds of law that we try to put together. Um, and so, you know, when I see, you know, various uh, politicians in the United States arguing against UNCLOS simply because it's one more intrusion of say international bodies onto our national sovereignty, I, you know, conceptually, I understand the, the argument, but this one's kind of a gimme. This one's actually pretty easy compared to so many of the other ones. And, you know, it, it would it would show some actual nuance if we could actually distinguish between the difficult international questions and the the ones that are clearly in our national interest to sign on to. Anyway, on that note, Jim, it is story time. I want to hear a story. Tell me a story. All right. Well, uh, talking to Iris Joe reminds me of my time in Jakarta. Very interesting place. Great tour. Uh, it had some challenges, one of which was it has uh, monsoons. And as you may know, Jakarta actually lies below sea level. So combining high tides, high rain uh, storms, a city of canals, it's not a good combination. So one day I'm at the embassy and I got a call from my wife who says, water's flooding into the house. Uh, what should I do? I can't bail fast enough. So I go with our regional security officer in his 1957 Jeep uh, to try and rescue her. We got about, I don't know, a half mile away before the floods were too big because actually one of the canal dikes broke. So we go wading to my wife through the canal water. Uh, I wish I could describe to you what the canal water contains. Uh, use your imagination. Um, so we're, we're fighting the tide. As we round the corner, there comes my wife on a raft with four Indonesian cops pushing her along. She's perfectly dry. She waves at us with a little, you know, royal family wave. Uh, I go home and disinfect at the hotel. But it was, it was an exciting time, and it made the front page of the embassy newsletter. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I, you know, uh, I, we could probably do a whole podcast just on uh, Southeast Asia natural disaster stories. <laughs> That's right. You gave your, your volcano one. So we have fire. We have That's water. Right. That's right. Maybe we can do grasshoppers next. <laughs> well, that was a constant joke uh, from my time in the Philippines. But yes, indeed. Or actually, uh, the end of our time in. Uh, so after you left Australia, where we had endured uh, the bushfires and we went straight into COVID and people were talking about locusts. So, well, on that note, Jim, uh, it's been great. Uh, I want to remind everyone uh, that we actually do have, if, you ha if you're not following us, if you are on X, which is Twitter, then you can find us on, uh, you can find us here on Indopac Podcast, at Indopac Podcast. Feel free to follow us there. You can also follow us on LinkedIn or YouTube or any of the any any of the other major uh, 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 social networks. But uh, for for today on X at Indo Indo Pac Podcast, join us there, and we'll see you next time on Why Should We Care About the Indo Pacific.